welcome to the Battle and the Bride. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you and we praise you for your word. We praise you, Lord, for the workers that you have put in the field, men who have labored throughout the ages, from the Old Testament to the New, who have given us examples of godly men who seek to do righteousness, to seek to do your righteousness and to do your will and to minister to those who are yours and to bring your message of hope and of good news and of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Father God, I pray that you would fill us all with your Holy Spirit and give us understanding as we examine this passage. Lord, so that we could know more about you and that that knowledge, that insight, that wisdom would transform our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, children, it was brought to my attention that for too long, I did not address you during the service. So I'm going to give you one right off the bat, but don't rest on your laurels. There will be more to come later. So the big question over the last month or so has been from your catechism, what is sanctification? It is God's making sinners holy in heart and conduct. Excellent job. Very good. Who here has heard of Audie Murphy? Audie Murphy, he was one of the most decorated American war heroes from World War II. So after the bombing of Pearl Harbor at the age of 16, he forged documentation so that he could get into the military uh, since he wasn't 18. He was rejected by every single branch of the service because of his size, except for the army. And when he got into the army, he quickly excelled in acts of valor in the battlefield. And during the time of his service, he received every single military combat award for valor available from the United States Army at that time. And at the age of 19, he received the Medal of Honor for his valor demonstrated at the Colmar Pocket in France in January of 1945. There, he single-handedly fought off a company of Germans for an hour. The Germans had destroyed an M10 tank. It was engulfed in flames. The crew abandoned it. He was the commander of this company and ordered them back to the safe position in the forest while he remained in his position in the field. And using his field radio, he directed the artillery for its bombardment of the Germans and fired with his his M1 carbine until he rushed to the tank, still flaming, climbed aboard, grabbed the 50 caliber, And for an hour, he shot at these Germans and he decimated a a squad that was crawling towards a ditch. He held them off and he did this until he ran out of ammunition. He dismounted the, the tank and ran back to his company, having been wounded and completely out of ammunition. But then 
He organized them and orchestrated a counterattack and then led it, even without ammo, and successfully routed the Germans and held them off. And even after that success, when they came to treat his wounds, he refused to leave his men. He wanted to be treated right there with him. So I bring this up as as a man who showed formidable courage in the face of death. And so what is it that makes a man unafraid of death? What is it in a man that makes him look at the situation, look at impending danger, assess it, and dismiss it rather than to run from it, to face it rather than to flee? It can't be stupidity. It can't be ignorance. The human mind is naturally inclined towards self-preservation. It senses danger. It alerts the whole body to either fight or to flee. So is this thing called bravery merely a chemical reaction? No. It has to do more with the whole man. It's not just chemicals. Jesus taught us and. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And Jesus, our King, our God, our Savior, he went willingly to the cross out of his great love for the Father and his great love for us. Our unblemished lamb, who had the weight of our sins set upon him as he was mocked, beaten, scourged, his flesh ripped from his bones, his blood pouring from his wounds as he was set upon the cross, who subjected himself willingly to the infinite wrath of God in order to die the death of sinners. There was no whimpering. There was no sniveling. There was no shrinking back. No giving in to temptation. He was assailed with all the power of darkness in that hour and never yielded. He gave no quarter to the enemy because no quarter would be given. The will of God would be accomplished and he would do it. Through the flogging and the beating, the pain, the weakness, the shame, he endured it. He endured it for the joy that was set before him. He endured it to complete the Father's will. He endured death to kill death. As the Lord declared in Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. And in his resurrection, he conquered the grave, destroying the sting of death, bringing many sons to glory. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having received the name that is above every name, having received all glory and blessing and honor and praise and authority and dominion forever. And as he sits enthroned, his command still stands, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So while for some men, their honor and their duty to their country or their king or the responsibility to their family or just the mere weight of the cause that they're fighting for, it may outweigh the fear of death, and it has throughout the ages, in such a way so that they do not hesitate when the king cries for them to go once more under the breach, to fill up it with the English dead. But the Christian, the Christian, they have a courage that is fueled by the Holy Spirit within us, 
a courage, an assurance, a power given to us by our King of Kings, and it is lavished upon us in love. It transforms the lowly and the humble, the cowardly and the worthless, makes them men and women of high regard, of noble rank, of unwavering virtue, and of selfless courage. Children, what did God give Adam and Eve besides bodies? Have you a soul as well as a body? Yes, I have a soul that can never die. How do you know that you have a soul? Because the Bible tells me so. Yes, you have a soul that can never die. And in the face of danger or of prison or of torture or of death, the Christian is emboldened by this, emboldened by the knowledge that their persecutors can only kill the body but they can never touch our soul. So we know that if our master suffered and died, we should not be surprised or dismayed when we are called upon to do the same. We know that our Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will stand upon the earth. We know that because he lives, we also shall live. And so the Christian should be a man or a woman of great courage of great boldness, and of great service to our Lord, Jesus Christ, the King. And so this brings us to our passage where we learn about the man Epaphroditus. And in this passage, Paul commends the man Epaphroditus to the Philippian church. They know him, but he relates the dire circumstances around his honorable ministry to Paul. And he instructs them on how to treat him now that he has returned. So what is, what's the point? What is the main thing that we're going to focus on today? The main thing is that the strength of the ministry of the church lies in the strength of the men that lead her. So then the leaders that the church should esteem are the ones willing to live, work, and die for Christ. And we'll see this exemplified in Paul's short account of Epaphroditus. We'll see in verses 25 through 26 his strength of character. And then in 27 through 28, we'll see Epaphroditus' sickness and God's mercy upon him. And then in verses 29 through 30, the command to esteem such men as him. So as we come to verses 25 through 26, we're introduced to him, and Paul tells us a lot about him in a very short amount of time. He gives us five defining characteristics of Epaphroditus. He is Paul's brother, Paul's fellow worker, a fellow soldier with Paul. He is also the Philippians' messenger and the one who ministered to Paul's need. Now, when he says brother, he is not Paul's physical brother. That is not what he is saying. He is Paul's brother by way of Christ. We Christians, we are adopted into the family of God, and that is why we are called the children of God. In John 1, 12 through 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And Jesus Christ is our brother. In, Mark, in Matthew 12, 50, he says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. It is why we call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family. The word that Paul uses, Adelphos, is always used in Scripture to describe fellow believers united by a bond of affection. Fellow believers united by a bond of affection. We are united in Christ and united by the love of Christ. Peter uses a variation of this in 1 Peter 2, 17, when he says to the church, love the brotherhood. It reminds us of the real fraternity that we enjoy as believers. We are a band of brothers. And this is how Paul recognized Epaphroditus. 
He recognized Timothy as his spiritual son in this letter, but he also calls Timothy our brother in other letters. This is how we should all consider one another in this room, brothers and sisters in Christ, and not just in this room, but all those who are of the faith. And how are we to behave towards one another in brotherly kindness? We're to have one another's backs, whether that's in ministering to each other's needs or protecting one another in adversity, rebuking one another in love, or forgiving one another. Seventy times seven in a single day for the exact same offense if necessary. He's also his fellow worker. Epaphroditus and Paul labor side by side for the Lord. It is possible to be a brother in Christ, but not share in the same ministerial work. But Paul and Epaphroditus, however, they are companions in this work, the work of God, ministering to men's souls, sowing seeds, and reaping a harvest. They preach the gospel. They minister to their churches. This is the full aim and purpose of their lives, to make disciples as directed by Jesus Christ. Now, the next characteristic, being a fellow soldier, this one has just stuck in my mind all week. And it's a characteristic that is often overlooked, I believe, in our current culture. A fellow soldier. This characteristic, it shows the mindset that Paul has in regards to the minister's of the Lord. They must be men suited for a specific kind of combat. He calls Epaphroditus a soldier. He calls Timothy a soldier and instructs, instructs him in ways to wage the good warfare. He calls Archippus in the book of Philemon a fellow soldier. The Christian is in a war. We are all to don the full armor of God because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We have songs about this. Onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. When I was a kid, we would always sing the I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly o'er the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I loved that because as a, a young boy, I loved the idea of being in the Lord's army, being in service to the king. But men like Paul and Epaphroditus, men like Timothy and Archippus, they were not just soldiers, they were men in leadership positions in the church, commanders of men. Men like them have a special target on their back. Calvin puts it in this way. He says of the term fellow soldiers that this is the condition of the ministers of the gospel that they are engaged in an incessant warfare, for Satan will not allow them to promote the gospel without maintaining a conflict. Let those then who prepare themselves for edifying the church know that war is denounced against them and prepared. This indeed is common to all Christians, to be soldiers in the camp of Christ, for Satan is the enemy of all. It is, however, more particularly applicable to the ministers of the word who go before the army and bear the standard. So this tells us something about Epaphroditus, doesn't it? If Paul calls him a soldier, a fellow soldier, it tells us that he was a faithful and honorable man of God who was not afraid to execute the duties and responsibilities of his office in order to glorify God. Due to his indispensable character, Paul found it absolutely necessary to send him back to the Philippians. 
After all, he was their messenger, which can be translated as apostle, but not in the big A apostle sense, like the 12 apostles and Paul, but in the sense that he was their evangelist, an ambassador sent to render service unto Paul while he was in prison. He came to minister to Paul while he was in chains. And it was probably a monetary gift that he brought from the Philippian church. Church, But why was it necessary? Why did he find it absolutely necessary to send them back? Well, Epaphroditus had found out, but the Philippians found out, that he had been sick. He was so concerned about this, it says that he was distressed about it. Now, we can look at the word distressed and we can easily imagine someone who's just fretting. Like, like oh my goodness. It's, the, the dinner's not going to be ready in time. Well, that's, that's not it. Or, oh, I, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of gas. That's, that's not distressed. Distressed, in the New Testament here, it is only used two other times. It means full of heaviness, to be greatly troubled, be full of anguish. It is used of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweated drops of blood in prayer prior to his arrest. So this was the sense that Epaphroditus had for this church. He was intensely longing for them to bring them comfort about his situation. He wanted to return to them He wanted to do that so that he could minister to them. He didn't care about his sickness. He cared about the church. So why why is this longing so so intense? And we'll see this in verses 27 through 28. Um, His longing is so intense because he almost died. They found out he had almost died. He was given a task by that church to go and render a service to Paul. And he saw it through. He did it, even though it almost cost him his life, even though his health was nearly spent in the execution of these orders. Here is this man's mindset, is that he is a servant to Christ the King. He has been transformed. He has been renewed. He has been made right with God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when he is given an opportunity to go and minister to a fellow brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier in Christ, He goes through with it all the way to the end and he goes willingly. He completes the mission. That is the goal. Paul's in chains. He needs this ministry given to him. And so I have to stop here and I have to address a glaring issue in our culture and that is the issue of a culture of comfort and a culture of ease. And so what's the danger in this? It produces a culture of laziness. As soon as there's any pushback, you sit down or you turn around. In our culture, we esteem those who have certain political leanings. We have uh, people that we esteem who have so many followers on social media or who pioneered some certain innovation and made a lot of money doing it. If you ask kids today what they want to be when they grow up, what do they want to be? Social media influencers, YouTubers. Why? Because those are the people that they're exposed to, and a lot of them make a lot of money by doing very little. So we live in a culture today where our heroes are boring, aren't they? We don't have great role models to look up to in our culture. And this type of thinking, this type of culture, this type of mindset has infected the pulpits around our, our country. Men and women in America, they tend to flock to men and women who stand in a pulpit who have the right clothes, the right style, the right delivery, they make the right promises. 
The message from pulpits today, it's a soft message that has nothing to do with sin. And that produces a soft people who think they're Christians. And they esteem soft leaders. And the resolve to persevere in the faith is as hard as pudding. We need men who are like Epaphroditus. They don't talk about men like Epaphroditus. They don't talk about them like they're heroes of the faith. In the Civil War, they had color bearers. It was the people who held the flag of the country that they were fighting for or the flag of their regiment. And it was a great honor to bear the standard of your regiment. And it was a terrible shame it was, it was an awful shame for your regiment's colors to fall into the hands of the enemies. There were soldiers who would risk life and limb to rush to the body of a fallen fellow soldier in the midst of heated battle, even behind enemy lines, in order to retrieve their regiment's colors and get them back to their side. Men of action, men of honor, men of courage. And our table talk this month, it talks about the lost virtue of honor. Very first article. An excellent article. Epaphroditus bore the standard of Christ in his actions. And he carried it with great distinction. But we learn that it was only by God's mercy that Epaphroditus was spared. Sickness and death, they are things that naturally occur to us. Our recovery, great or small, is dependent upon Lord, dependent upon the mercy of God. Now, his intervention in such matters is not required. Therefore, it is mercy. But it is certainly sought ardently through our prayers and our supplications. And God was merciful on Epaphroditus, but this was not for any reason. Paul doesn't say, because Epaphroditus did this or this or this, he was spared. It's purely by God deciding to have mercy on him. And this mercy was simply given out of the good grace of our Lord's sovereignty. Now Paul knows that to live is Christ but to die is gain. However, the loss of such a man as Epaphroditus would have been a tremendous loss in the lives of those left behind, those fellow believers who knew him, a great worker in the church. And so it would be a terrible, sorrowful loss. Now, we are not Stoics. We are not divorced from emotion. When a good pastor dies, the church weeps. The loss is felt. Paul knew this well. In his day, many of the leaders of the church were martyred. You look at Fox's book of martyrs. Everybody but the Apostle John. And they tried really hard to martyr Apostle John. They all fell for the name of Christ. Now, if Epaphroditus had died, they would have still been able to rejoice in his service and the man that he was, the life that he led, the faith that he held to. But they they would have mourned his loss. It would have been terrible. But he did not die. So Paul sent him back to this church, the church that he cared so much for, so deeply for. Why? So that they may rejoice. So that they may rejoice and so that he too would be less sorrowful when he learned of their reuniting. So in verses 29 through 30, he says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service 
toward me. So the Philippians knew there was something they needed to do for Paul and he needed to be ministered to in a certain way and it was their responsibility to do it for them and if they didn't, that it would, it would be a great shame. But they sent Epaphroditus, they entrusted him with this, this task and this care and he did it and he saw it through. So what is the reason for receiving such valiant men as Epaphroditus? What is the reason why they should hold him in such high regard? Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his own life. And this is the characteristic of a man with the mind of Christ. This is the characteristic of a man with the mind of Christ. Just as Paul related earlier in chapter 2, about Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and was exalted. And this is a characteristic of the Old Testament saints, as we see in Hebrews, who endured hardship and trial for the truth of God, for the ministry of his saints. These are the acts of valor that we should expect to see from leaders in the church. When the occasion presents itself, these are the acts of valor we should expect to see from the leaders of, in the church. And so the strength of the ministry of the church lies in the strength of the men that lead her. Now take all the pastoral doctors in America, line them up with their robes, their diplomas, their academic accolades, all the books that they've written, the articles that they've put out there, Line them all up and ask this question. For the faith that they claim to represent, could they stand the rack? Or would they much prefer simply writing cushy articles for the Gospel Coalition from the comfort of their couches? Now in Fox's Book of Martyrs, he tells in, uh, I believe it was 249, during the persecutions of, of Decius, there was a man named Nicomachus, who was brought before the proconsul on charges that he was a Christian. The proconsul ordered him to make a sacrifice before a pagan idol, and he refused. He said, why would I give to the devils only that which is worthy of the Almighty? And so they, they tortured him. Except after a time of torture, he recanted. And after shortly having recanted, it says that he fell into such agony, dropped on the floor, and died. There was a woman named Denisa. She was 16 years old who was watching this happen, and she cried out, Oh, poor wretch, miserable wretch, to trade a moment of ease for an eternity of torment. And they heard her, and they apprehended her, and brought her before the proconsul, and she was found to be a Christian, and she was beheaded. So the question must be asked of us, for the sake of Christ and our Christian duty, would we endure hardship? Would we endure nakedness or famine or sword? Now the example of Christ himself, as well as the examples of those who've gone before, such as Paul, Timothy, Peter, Epaphroditus, they should encourage us. God worked within the ministers of the early church to work and to will his good pleasure. And they should certainly encourage us in a time that we've just gone through since 2020 with the whole COVID debacle. You don't have to line up pastors and their doctorates and all that. It's been done for you. Pastors who kept their church's doors closed for fear. who submitted to the will of the government over the will of God, who neglected the meaning of the saints and who condemned the saints for meeting. Their colors have been shown and that was a soft opening. So the church needs strong men. But God works just as he worked in Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, he works in us too. 
He works in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. He does the same then as he does now. If we are lacking in zeal, if we're deficient in endurance, if we feel like we are incapable of valor for the king, God can refine and sanctify you. He can fortify you. He can make you strong. He can make you strong in the Lord and in his mighty power so that in the day of evil, having done all you can do, you can, like a faithful and good soldier of God, stand. But he also gives you the Holy Spirit to understand those times when your conscience accuses you of cowardice And it is simply the lies of the devil. We are to live in truth. And I say again that the strength of the ministry of the church lies in the strength of the men that lead her. So let us be men of courage, men of valor, men of God, not given to the softness of the culture, but given to the word, given to prayer, given to worship, given to the ministry of the saints to one another. Men and women working together for the cross of Christ, even at the cost of Christ. It doesn't matter what lies ahead, it matters that Christ is the head of the church. If we are given an assignment, it is our duty to follow it faithfully. We could go on and give stories and stories of the men and women in the Bible, heroes of the faith. The great saints who have laid down their lives or who counted their lives as nothing for the cost of the glory of God. Men who did not care for the glory of men, but lived only to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So let us not shrink back. Whatever it is that is assailing you or accusing you right now, you can take that to the cross. You can give it to God. He takes men like Gideon who are cowering in a wine press, hiding from the Philistines, and raises him up to be a leader. He takes people like Seth Dean who had no love for God, no love for people, who loved his sin so much that he He hid it from all the other Christians around him who was a coward when it came to speaking up for Christ and transformed him by the power of the gospel. Save me from sin and death and hell. To the point now where he's given me the great honor of of the call to be a, a pastor. And that's why I'm in seminary. I'm not saying this to boast about me. I, if, if you truly knew, <laughs> and I think we can all say that of ourselves. Amen. Just how great and glorious the transforming work of God is in our lives. So we have nothing to be ashamed about, nothing to be afraid about, whether it's sickness, whether it's the sword. Epaphras, Epaphroditus wasn't, wasn't worried about you know, Roman soldiers, I mean, he may have been, but that wasn't the cause of his, his, his illness. It was just something natural. And yet throughout it, we see God's mercy. We see the valor of these men who are willing to work for God despite all odds. So I will close there and I will pray. I'll pray for us. Lord God, we are your people. You have set us apart and you have called us for the service of Jesus Christ and the ministry to one another and the spreading of the gospel. And Lord, I know that each one of us here senses this deep need for courage and for living godly lives of righteousness in this current day and age. And Lord, we long to do so. And Father, we are constantly confronted by our sins that snare us by those others who call themselves Christians and who oppose us. 
But Father God, we ask in Jesus' name for your might and your strength. You are our strong fortress. You are our rock, the God of our salvation. And Father, I pray for each man and woman, for each child here, that you would work in them the power of the Holy Spirit and raise up within them this great desire, this great valor that would neglect our own misery, Lord, so that we could go on and press forward like all the saints of old who pressed forward onto the goal so that they could obtain the prize, the prize of eternal life with Christ, Lord, so that we could do your will, we could minister to those who are lost, so that we could see great victories for the name of Christ in our lives, Lord, and fight great battles, spiritual battles, and see great victories. Lord, that's what we desire to see. And Father, if it is your will that we must see suffering first, then I pray that you would give us all boldness to stand firm in the midst of it, just like Christ facing the cross. Because we know that at the end of that, it is purely your glory. Whether we see victories in our day or we see death, at the end of it, it is only and ever all for your glory because your glory is, is all that is due you. And so, Father, I pray you would minister to each one of us the areas that we know we are deficient and that you would strengthen us in those areas so that we could be men and women of God. And, Lord, those lies that the enemy is lobbing at us right now, accusing us of of wrongdoing or of cowardice in areas where it is not so, we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and to help us stand firm against those wiles so that, Lord, we would not be ashamed, we would not be hindered, but that we could press on. So, Father, I pray for this church that you would continue to embolden it and make it mighty for your, your work, for your good, for the gospel, and for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Battle and the Bride. If you liked this episode, please subscribe, share, and leave a review. For more information, visit thebattleandthebride.com. If you have any questions, you can email us at thebattleandthebride at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless.